Today's fifth program in exploring climate change in Vermont features Brian Tokar. I am your host, Steve Lobb, and welcome, Brian. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here today. Good. We can start by you giving us a little background of what you do in relation to climate change here in Vermont, and tell us about what you teach in connection with the Institute for Social Ecology. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I've been living here in central Vermont since the early 1980s and have been part of, as you mentioned, an organization called the Institute for Social Ecology, which has been doing international education on a host of environmental and social and political issues actually since way back in the mid-1970s. It started uh, at what is now Cade Farm, which was then part of the campus of Goddard College and used to run huge programs with hundreds of people in the, through the mid to late 1970s at the very beginning of conversations about alternative energy technology and organic agriculture and a lot of things that we tend to take for granted here in Vermont now uh, were brand new then and people were coming to the Institute to study. Uh, we operated at a much smaller scale now. We had our own campus up on Maple Hill in Plainfield for a number of years. Now we really do most of our teaching out on the road. Uh, we had a program in San Francisco this past spring. Uh, we've done seminars in New York City and Western Mass and uh, a lot of other places as well as uh, an internal gathering that happens in Marshfield every summer. <clears throat> but I'm also lecturing in the environmental program at UVM these days. I've been there for about 10 years and I teach a series of activist-oriented classes on environmental issues and, and movements uh, around food and climate and a whole host of things, including a new class coming up this spring specifically focused on energy and climate issues here in Vermont, and students will be doing projects with a number of different organizations over the course of the semester. All right. Um, I've been writing about climate issues pretty intensively for about 10 years, but my background goes way back before that. I really got into environmental activism uh, in the 1970s during the height of the movement against nuclear power here in New England and around the country and really around the world, and saw how an organized social movement can really not only change policy, but change the way people think about uh, the relationship of our communities to all of nature. And that happened in the case of uh, stopping the expansion of nuclear power at a period when the U.S. government was planning on pushing ahead as, as fast as they could. And that movement also raised issues about what the world should look like, what the alternatives are, uh, how we can build our communities in a more resilient way that doesn't depend on those kinds of inherently destructive technologies. So my background goes back to the anti-nuclear movement. I took a break from energy issues for many years, focused on uh, toxics with the movement that came out of the struggle in Williamstown that folks might remember in the 1980s. I worked on uh, food and GMO issues for many years out of the Institute. We coordinated the statewide town meeting campaign against GMOs in the early to mid 2000s where eventually more than 80 towns passed resolutions against GMOs and that led to big debates in the legislature and was really the precursor to the more recent wave of activism that led to Vermont passing GMO labeling which of course went into effect uh, just before the point where uh, our law was completely preempted by the feds. But raising consciousness through our town meetings here in Vermont is something we've been very much engaged in at the Institute for Social Ecology for many years. Now, that's, that's interesting to hear you talk of that. Uh, 
in the 70s and uh, eight, early 80s. I personally was in Hawaii mm -hmm. doing similar things where we started a Hawaiian seafood plantation, which was aquaculture. Great. And very experimental and very huge. It was 160 acres of, of uh, uh, intense aqua farming. And then with the theme of nuclear is too much, especially Hawaii with the military, right. uh, we started the first wind farm uh, in Hawaii, which could have been one of the first in the United States. Fantastic. As a demonstration uh, of how wind power is important. So uh, as time goes on, uh, we learn our different connections Absolutely. to the past. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, back in the 70s at the Institute, they were going, they were traveling around the country finding these old wind power generators on farms in the Midwest mostly that had been out of use for decades and they were bringing them here and refurbishing them and creating the first generation of wind power here in Vermont as well. Of course, those turbines were very small scale. They were yes. basically enough to operate a single farmstead yes. uh, and were tiny compared to the facilities that we're seeing going up now. Yeah. And so but in terms of climate issues, uh, I've been really focused on the climate situation again now. Uh, f again, for about 10 years, I started writing articles on the theme of climate justice back around 2006, uh, starting to get messages from allies and colleagues around the world that we really needed to pay attention not just to climate science, but also to the inherent social justice dimensions of the climate crisis. And that led to a series of articles that eventually led to me writing this book, which okay. folks can see, hopefully, on the camera, um, called Toward Climate Justice. This is actually the revised edition that came out in 2014. And since this book came out, uh, I've redoubled my focus on, on these issues. I've been on the board of the Vermont affiliate of the 350.org network. 350 Vermont was established just a few years ago as really the first state-based group affiliated with the big international network to take on its own campaigns and have a distinct identity as a Vermont-based organization. Uh, we helped start that uh, along with some of my students from UVM back then. Um, and right now, through 350 Vermont and a number of other organizations, uh, great support from the Vermont Sierra Club, for example, uh, once again, we're going to town meetings around the state, this time with petitions calling for a number of things. One, a ban on any further expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure in Vermont, the gas pipeline that many of us were involved in fighting over the last four or five years in Chittenden and Addison counties was really the biggest expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure here in Vermont. Uh, in many decades, and it's clear that if we're going to do something about the climate situation, the first thing we have to do is end the expansion of the use of fossil fuels. And of course, anything we build now is going to be uh, expected to be operating for 30, 40, 50 years into the future, and we need to be off fossil fuels by then, according to all the climate scientists in order to have any chance of the world of the future bearing any reasonable similarity to the world that we grew up in. So ending fossil fuel infrastructure, more rapid adoption of energy conservation and renewable energy, because you know the state has set these general goals of 90% by 2050, but we're far behind where we need to be in order to get there. 
and then to make that transition in our energy systems in a way that's genuinely just and equitable and people in communities that have a high energy burden uh, because they have long commutes or we live in houses that aren't well insulated. Vermont is the oldest housing stock in the country and a lot of drafty old houses that use much more energy than they should. It shouldn't be the burden of those individuals to bear the cost of the transition. It needs to be shared in a reasonable way and there are a number of proposals uh, including uh, for carbon fees and uh, changes in the tax system to uh, address the problem in an equitable way. And then also a number of towns, Marshfield being one, have added to their petitions a number of specific steps that their town energy committees have developed, changes that they want to see happen to their town infrastructure, to their transportation systems, to specific measures that can happen on the town level to get us to where we want to be at a, at a more reasonable pace. So that's a very current effort. Uh, and here in Montpelier, folks are petitioning to get it on the town meeting day ballot. And I hope people will be uh, following the discussion and, and coming out and voting for uh, more renewable energy and a ban on more fossil fuels on town meeting day. Town meetings are a very wonderful and efficient way to uh, let the voices be heard to uh, those uh, who make the laws. Yes. And that's a wonderful part of Vermont that uh, means we have a little bit of edge on other places that don't have town meetings. Definitely. So it's Definitely. wonderful. Okay. Um, now to set the stage for further conversation and uh, to emphasize to the public uh, the unprecedented weather phenomena that has been going on just in the past six months, the summer, uh, I'd like to point out a few things. Uh, so that we don't lose focus of what goes on outside Vermont and will, as time goes on, influence what goes on inside Vermont a whole lot. So I'll mention here uh, weather events unprecedented in extended regions, we'll say, around Vermont, and think of how we might relate them, them to what we might expect here in the future, and maybe near future. Just in the past summer, in North America and Caribbean, there were three powerful hurricanes at all at one time going down Hurricane Alley where the water was up to 90 degrees mm -hmm. warm, the water. Uh, wow. in the uh, Hurricane Alley. Uh, I used to live and dive in those waters and anything above, say, 82 both stirs up a hurricane and it's miserable to swim in. I'm sure. <laughs> and 90 degrees for me is like the frog uh, in the boiling pot. Mm -hmm. But no one would have believed such a thing even 10 years ago. That heated water also applies to acidification of the ocean killing the basis of the food chain. Right. And the coral reefs and so much. Uh, so there's a lot of powerful things going on in that way. 
There were also, at one time last summer, five different hurricanes threatening the U.S. all at once. Yep. This is the first time. And, uh, and the intensity, I think the, the crucial point is that the intensity of this past summer's hurricanes was in, unprecedented. And the intensity of hurricanes is directly correlated with sea temperature. Big time. The heat of the ocean in the tropics and subtropics is where hurricanes that actually sweep across the Atlantic from uh, the continent of Africa, uh, the temperature of the ocean is what determines how strong those storms are. And another occurrence uh, last December, uh, and then again recently, having hurricanes wander up past the 45 degree latitude. Right. Up into the way northern Atlantic, up between Norway and Greenland, mm -hmm. uh, almost going around Iceland. And then one this summer reached all the way across to Ireland and Scotland, which yes. I don't believe has ever happened before. Exactly. No, no, this is, this is all new. And the, the, the worst effect in some ways of these big storms is the big waves yes. that won't let the ice freeze. Right. So particularly in December, where uh, ice is trying to freeze, if we send big waves up there and break it all up, it's just not good. Yeah. Uh, plus that warm water, of course, both from the uh, Norwegian Sea and from the Bering Sea, mm -hmm. go up and go under the North Pole. So that last December, I do remember many times it was warmer at the North Pole above freezing than it was in Vermont. Yes, that's and, right. And I didn't check it today, but that could well be. I, yeah, the I whole did, latter, yeah. I don't think that's the case right now, but the whole latter part of last year, Arctic temperatures were running 30, 35 degrees warmer than normal. Yes. It including the uh, last another yeah. unprecedented situation and before we get past the hurricanes of this past summer we have to make sure we don't overlook the incredible devastation that people experienced in the wake of those storms the devastation of neighborhoods in and around Houston Texas and the rest of the Texas Gulf Coast and then the subsequent two storms, the effects they had on so many of the Caribbean islands, uh, including Puerto Rico. Whoa, Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico uh, is for me special in that I have two children born there. Wow. And I have lived and loved Puerto Rico very much, fished and sailed. and. Uh, what is going on now, government-wise, with our federal government? Won't do. Yeah, I just read this week that there are parts of Puerto Rico that expect to be without electricity for another seven months. Yes, and that could be way longer. Yeah, and there's actually a delegation of a handful of Vermont activists, I just read, that are heading down to Puerto Rico to help some of those communities that are still without electric power uh, get equipped with water filters and other passive technologies to help them survive this interim period until they get the power restored. Right. So people can look that up and, and support that effort. Yeah. yeah, that's a biggie in my books. I was in Hurricane Hugo in the eye of it. Wow. In St. Croix aboard a boat, <laughs> my own boat that I built. Amazing. With four children on board. One was four month old. Whoa. And uh, <laughs> was that ever a nice little plane ride? <laughs> Can't even imagine. It wasn't that bad for us because we were well tied down. Right. 
but uh, of course, it was six months to a year before we got electricity back hmm. in St. Croix. And um, and St. Croix is, is, is small, and actually the homes are built pretty more substantial than in most places in the Caribbean, where in St. Croix, and I was part of this, we set hurricane building standards, mm -hmm. and uh, that helps a lot. I'll bet. But as the hurricanes get stronger, well, the standards got to be stronger, right. and it gets observed at, at some point. So, yep. Yeah. So that, and, you know, there are places all along the eastern seaboard of, of the U.S. that are facing similar problems. I mean, we read about the, the streets of Miami now being flooded on a regular basis and increasing vulnerability to uh, intense storms and, uh, and ocean waves all the way up the coast at least as far as Virginia, yeah. and there are some incredibly vulnerable, there are some especially vulnerable places all the way up through the Carolinas in Virginia that in Jersey, we don't it, hear it, much yeah. about here, but in Jersey, remember Hurricane Sandy that happened the year after Vermont was hit by Hurricane Irene. Yeah. Irene was in 2011, in 2012, uh, Hurricane Sandy became a so-called superstorm. It was the convergence of several storm currents coming from different directions. And yes, the coasts of New Jersey and Staten Island and other places uh, all the way up into Connecticut. But I am always wondering, like Sandy is a good example. Uh, as storms get stronger and move in areas where they aren't typical of before. Right. Uh, when are we going to get something and or some storms that we can't repair yeah. from? Yeah. And, and there are parts of Vermont that are still rebuilding from Irene. Yes. Uh, and people may or may not remember that Irene, which happened in August, came on the heels of widespread flooding here in central Vermont and, and other places uh, just that previous spring. So I remember that May uh, there was major damage to almost every significant road and even a lot of smaller back roads here in central Vermont. And then on the heels of that, we got hit by Irene at the end of August. <laughs> and that had never happened before here. But and we, it's just a matter of time before it comes again. And, you know, there are some infrastructure improvements that have been made uh, to prevent the same thing from happening again. But there are still a lot of people living in those narrow valleys uh, that are almost certain to be hit again at some point in the oh, yeah. not too distant future. Well, I was uh, working on the Slayton farm mm -hmm. during Irene. Right. When the river rose 12 feet. Yeah. The farm. Knocked out that uh, trailer park yes, right the trailer down the park. road. Uh, and uh, the, the, the organic farm there right. uh, was inundated. Yep. And uh, I mean, it was bad. It, it was a, like a lake. Yeah. Uh, and I remember leaving as the water rose. Mm hmm. Uh, coming here to Montpelier and getting uh, uh, ice chests full of food, mm -hmm. uh, kind of responding to the way I would in the Caribbean, because right. we, get, we get that a lot. Uh, and I went back to see at 3 in the morning, uh, police and fire department with their lights, mm -hmm. which is freaky, yeah. uh, in the middle of the night, while boats were parked there, hmm. um, and people were swimming ashore. 
Whoa. <laughs> yes. Unbelievable. You know, that's a big, a, a big mark in my mind. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm recalling that just before we went on the air, you described yourself as a Vermont climate refugee. Yes, <laughs> yes, I I am a, uh, a climate refugee from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, as my age increased and with heart attack, I decided I needed to seek healthier climate. Yes, and I'm happy here. But yes, well, we're glad you're here. <laughs> Uh, you know, and of course, I, th I think it's important to remind folks that there's still a lot of uncertainty, and uncertainty isn't a problem. Uncertainty is inherent to the process yes. of, of scientific inquiry, yes. Yes. and there is still and will continue to be uncertainty about the climate contribution of particular weather events. Surely. But there are a number of things that are very clear. And I think it's important as people weigh the relationship between particular weather events and long range climate trends to understand some basic facts. The first is warmer air, and the Earth on average is a degree warmer. Uh, a degree Celsius, that is, which is almost two degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than in pre-industrial times. Warmer air holds more moisture. At this point, it's a difference of a few percent, but that few percent is enough to create a situation where a higher proportion of our precipitation comes in the form of extreme storms. The northeastern U.S. turns out to be the most affected by that. You know, we're not as affected by the hurricanes and the extreme floods and droughts and wildfires that we read about in other parts of the country. But here in the northeast, the proportion of our precipitation that comes in the form of extreme storms has increased, has almost doubled. It's gone up by 75% in just the last decade or two. So the first is warmer air holds more moisture, and that means that more of our precipitation comes in the form of uh, these drawn out periods where the weather doesn't change. You know, the atmosphere holds more moisture, and then it takes longer to release it. So, so that's one thing. The yeah, second it, thing. It, it seemed to me uh, this past summer, and particularly toward fall, that the rivers were just drying up. Yeah. After they were at some of the highest levels we can remember in the spring and early summer. But so. Yeah, I, I built a dinghy to take down the Winooski River from. Uh, the headwaters to the lake and do some camera work and a fun adventure. Mm -hmm. uh, and the river was so low, I couldn't float my dinghy. Unbelievable. And I had to put wheels on it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then I decided it's getting to be a silly project that oh. I better put on the back burner. But both the Dog River, where I am often, and, and the Winooski, so low. Yes. And uh, to lower than I'd ever seen it. And uh, that's not a statistic, because uh, you know, I don't really uh, see it all the time and haven't been here that long. But anyway. Yeah, and that was immediately following a period where the rivers were at their typical spring maximum well into the beginning of the summer, longer yeah. than I can remember that being the case for. Yeah. Uh, and I've been here 30 years. So, you know, there's just the correlation of, of water vapor with temperature. Then we have the, the extent to which the severity of storms directly follows the predictions of the climate models, climate scientists have gotten more and more sophisticated, mo sophisticated at modeling the Earth's atmosphere, predicting long-term trends. 
And the climate models have been telling us that we're going to be experiencing increasingly severe storms and that the pattern of severe storms and the pattern of uh, temperature increase is going to follow a certain profile over the map of the Earth where the most intense effects are in the tropics and subtropics and in the extreme Arctic. And here in Vermont, we feel a little bit protected, as, as you've said, from some of the, those extremes because we're in that intermediate zone between the heightened effects in the tropics and subtropics and the heightened effects uh, in the extreme Arctic. But that distribution of, of climate and weather effects is, is what the climate modelers have been predicting and talking about for, for well over a decade now. And then the third thing is that finally in just the last six or seven years, climate scientists have gotten a handle on the methodology for how to actually calculate the climate contribution of particular weather events. Ten years ago, nobody really knew how to do that. And the first significant paper came out at the, the early in 2011, looking at uh, some catastrophic flooding that happened in the UK in the early 2000s. And they were able to say that within a particular statistical confidence level, you could say that the likelihood of this storm having happened without climate change was much, much smaller. And that science of um, calculating the, the climate contributions of particular weather events is getting better and better. The uh, major national meteorological organization now issues a major report on this every year. And they're able to say, we know that, for example, hurricane intensity is a function of ocean temperature. So what's that contribution? Uh, what are the contributions of other specifically climate-related factors? And we can say some much more definitive things about the attribution of particular weather events to long-range changes in the climate. Just a observation that I've wondered about, and this is more of a gut feeling than uh, the fact that I've uh, kept up with all the climate modeling. Mm -hmm. But so many times in looking at the models, I've said to myself, this can't be right. And what now I'm hearing from uh, some well-known, high-powered, very respectable climate scientists is that our models have been off on the timing bad. So the things that were supposed to happen 100 years ago or 50 years ago, that what looking from 15 years ago mm -hmm. are happening today. You mean 150 to 100 years from now are happening today? Yes. It's happening faster. Yes, way yes. faster. Yes. And this... Uh, 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 The hockey stick effect, the exponential exactly. effect, yeah. has seemed to kick in stronger than anybody anticipated. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Like uh, another uh, strange... You know, uh, 10 years ago, most climate scientists believed that if we were able to keep average warming worldwide below 1.5 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels, that we would be able to continue living in a relatively stable climate. And now we're only two-thirds of the way there, and we see the effects that it's having. And of course, the diplomats have been pushing for a two-degree limit. And all of the projections from the various pledges that countries have brought to the table 
uh, at the UN negotiations since the Paris Agreement was signed a couple of years ago. Um, those projections take us out to three, three and a half, maybe four degrees relative to pre-industrial times. Again, that's four degrees Celsius, which is about seven and a half degrees Fahrenheit. So we're getting, we're approaching, if we're not able to do something relatively quickly about this situation, a range of temperature difference comparable to the difference between the present day and the last ice age. The difference is getting, is heading toward becoming that extreme. And, you know, we talk about wildfires and floods and hurricanes now and the projections for what we're facing if we get into that three to four degree range um, are, are just truly horrifying. We're right. talking about the complete breakdown of any semblance of climate stability anywhere on Earth. Yeah, and then that leads to government st instability. Yeah. And then we don't even want to think about where all that leads. Well, you know, people have been saying for a long time that if we can't solve this problem, I, mem I remember Al Gore wrote this in his first book back in 1991 before he ran for vice president, that if we can't address this problem in a sensible way relatively soon, we're going to be facing very extreme, very authoritarian, militarized approaches to trying to solve it. And that was 20 years ago. And that was 25 years ago. And now our ago. military does take this way more seriously than our leader. Exactly. And um, yes, it's a, a huge factor in national security. It is. Yeah. A another thing that happened this summer, uh, which is kind of ir irony, um, I have built a boat called Celeb, meant for the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And it uh, is a work boat uh, with an underneath configuration almost like catamaran. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it is, in fact, a Celeb. Wow. Uh, and in my dreams five years ago, this summer was going to be the time when I sail out the St. Lawrence up to Greenland, and then we'll see from there. Well, for the first time ever, and unthinkable for everybody, mm -hmm. there was an ice jam from the Arctic all the way down the coast of Labrador to Newfoundland. Really? This, there were ancient icebergs that because of the warming of the Arctic waters had dislodged themselves from sort of being frozen in hmm. and were able to, to move with the current. Hmm. They mixed with frozen ice, and this is summer, mm -hmm. uh, we'll say coagulated, for lack of another word, and that whole coast of Labrador and Newfoundland jam-packed. So inaccessible. Well, thank God I didn't make it. My yeah. little boat would have been eaten alive. Mm -hmm. But the Coast Guard, with their latest research vessel mm -hmm. was there to do research on ice, and they got stuck. Unbelievable. The icebreaker stuck, hmm. along with ferries, fishing boats, the worst is oil tankers. Yes. Uh, I mean, this isn't nice to hear oil tankers stuck in ice with big icebergs, hmm. it's a bad combination. Yeah, especially for those of us who remember what happened in Alaska oh back in the gosh, late 80s. Yeah, yeah th these oil spill type things with yeah. cold, just uh, there's no way to clean them up. Right. And particularly in that part of the world, there's a fishing industry that is hugely important. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the 
that was also a unprecedented phenomena. Uh, the Gulf Stream, I'm told, is beginning to slow down. Yes, I've read that too. And the effects of it sending currents up around Greenland mm -hmm. has a lot to do with this phenomenon of the ice jam. Makes sense. Uh, and not only... And also the ability of that hurricane to, to reach across to, to Ireland. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That, that as well. Uh, and then we all know about the unprecedented floods and fires we're having everywhere, particularly yeah. in states and just all over. What's happening in California now? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Northern California just a couple of months ago. Temperatures well over 100 for most of Northern California all the way up to Seattle this summer. Seattle was 124 degrees Fahrenheit at one day. That I didn't hear. Yeah, I did. And, and the reason I it was it was over 100. The reason it wasn't hotter, they said, hmm. like four degrees hotter, hmm. was that there was a film of smoke hmm. uh, making a cooling effect hmm. from the forest fires in Canada. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, these are big numbers uh, yeah. to confront. Uh, and an here's another thing I'll mention that uh, when, when I see the, the jet stream on the weather news and the way the Arctic vortex, polar vortex wobbles, right. it seems to wobble nicely for Vermont. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying to grasp this. <laughs> Uh, uh, if that isn't also part of the reason that Vermont has less problems in many places. But here's, here's what I'm going to mention now. Last spring, the Arctic polar vortex crossed the equator. Right, I remember that. First time ever such a thing. Yeah. And it was sort of a one-shot affair. Right. But later in the summer, there was a period where both the Arctic and the Antarctic polar vortexes wobbled all the way down to the equator at the same time and mixed with each other. Hmm. And that was all around the world. Hmm. And then, it wasn't long after that, that we had all this hurricane activity uh, in the Caribbean with leading up to Irma. But this wobbling of the jet stream, uh, never having crossed the equator before in our history, doing it on massive scale is really unnerving. It is, and there's a lot of debate about the extent of it and the severity of it, but it, it's clear that everywhere on Earth things are happening that we haven't seen before. I mean, this, we're having this conversation the last week in December, and we're getting our first extended period of consistent uh, single numbers and below zero weather in quite a number of years, and I have a lot of friends who don't remember that this is the way it used to always be this, this time of year. Well, I've been praying for sub-zero weather here. <laughs> We've gotten yeah. used to whole seasons going by without any of it. Yeah. That's for sure. And of course, this all leads to a thing we touched on a little while, a bit ago here in the conversation, um, the migration of people. Yes. Uh, when you add the weather phenomena to the war phenomena mm -hmm. in the Middle East uh, and the unrest in Latin America, uh, 
you wonder, and, and there is a very small amount of, say, migration now here in Vermont. Uh, the wonderful uh, Mexican dairy farmers who have saved that industry here right. uh, is an ongoing phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, we are getting a trickle of uh, migrants from war-torn and weather-torn Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course the Syrian civil war was partly yes. a climate-related phenomenon because yes. the drought that's affected the Middle East uh, all the way across to parts of Central Asia and as far south as Southern Africa over the last several years forced a lot of uh, a lot of people in Syria off the land. Uh, there are parts of Syria where people lost more than 80 percent of their livestock due to drought uh, in the last five, ten years. Uh, people got forced into the city, and that was a contributing factor uh, to the beginning of the Civil War. It turned out not so much that people who were recent immigrants to major cities like Aleppo didn't get along. It's that they had common grievances and were coming together, and that was seen as a threat by the dictatorship in Syria. Um, so those refugees from the Syrian Civil War are to some extent also climate refugees. Of course, massive migrations of uh, well over 100,000, possibly several hundred thousand people from the Horn of Africa, from Somalia, parts of Ethiopia that have been in drought for uh, close to 10 years now, uh, fleeing to the south, uh, creating a lot of instability and, and problems in, in other parts of Africa, and then of course the, the refugees trying to get into Europe, which Europe is finding itself increasingly unable to deal with in a, a politically sensible way. Big time, yeah. I, I remember something that came to my mind uh, politically uh, was when the wall fell, the West German uh, government and people uh, <laughs> were happy to accept Eastern refugees from East Germany mm -hmm. and they didn't even talk about how much it will cost. Mm -hmm. They just said it's the right thing to do, let's do it, bite the bullet, whatever it costs, so be it. And then Germany and Europe is the leading country for accepting refugees from war-torn Middle East. Right. And now Merkel has a backlash about that. Yeah. Um, she wants to accept hundreds of thousands, and and even in the attitude of whatever it costs, it's the right thing to do. But uh, politically, it's it's getting harder and harder with the right turning elements. Yeah, and the the most vicious anti-immigrant politics, po possibly in the world. Uh, significantly more extreme than what we're seeing here in the U.S. is in uh, parts of Eastern Europe, yes. in Hungary and Poland. Yeah. Some of the most vicious, racist yes. politics is, is even closer to the surface there than it is here now. Yes, that's, that's, that's true. That's so true, and I can think of many things uh, to get off the subject in that right. direction. <laughs> but... Um, uh, here's a thought. Mm -hmm. I believe it was in The Guardian, I read an article that said, United States, and we can throw England in there too, uh, are the countries that are mostly responsible for the Industrial Revolution. Yes. For much of the CO2 that's already been put in the air, mm -hmm. that even if we stop today, that effect will go on and on and on. Right, because carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. And 
add to that starting wars all over the place. Right. There's a certain sense in which particularly U.S. is responsible for a big part of all the upheaval of migrations of peoples all over the world. Absolutely. So, if we want to do fairness and justice in the light of what we have much created, mm -hmm. of course not all, then how many refugees should we be bringing in? Mm -hmm. And the numbers were hundreds of thousands up to 100 million. Wow. Can the richest country in the world afford it? It depends on if you want to bite the bullet or not. And it depends on what we're spending our money on instead, giving tax cuts to absolutely. people who don't need it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Continuing to build up the military at a point when uh, U.S. military expenditures far exceed the rest of the world combined. Uh, we're throwing money in all the wrong directions at a point when the needs are, are really clear for what we need to be doing. Yeah. And the institutions and individuals that have the most influence over this political system and it's become so much more blatant under the current administration where agencies that are supposed to regulate various industries are being stocked with uh, operatives from those industries. We saw that during the Reagan years. We saw that during the Bush years. It's gotten so extreme now that it's, it's really unlike anything we've seen where, you know, the, the EPA and other agencies are being filled with, uh, the, the staffs of those agencies are being filled with people whose mission is to shut them down and literally prevent them from functioning. Um, and in some ways, it's the death throes of a, of a system that's proven itself to be completely unsustainable. Uh, and in some ways, it's kind of the last desperate effort of those incredibly powerful economic interests to extract as much as they can, to concentrate as much wealth and power as they can before uh, the consequences of the system become so extreme yes. that they don't have a chance. Uh, they're really trying to lock in changes in the legal system, changes in the financial system, changes in the political system that uh, if they have their way would make it impossible for us to make the changes that we need to in order to move to a saner, more humane, and more uh, ecologically sustainable future. Well, thank God Vermont has at least Saunders and McGibbon here among many, many other uh, people uh, that have a vision on the right track mm -hmm. and it can make us feel uh, glad and proud uh, to be a, a part of that. Absolutely. And of course our current state administration uh, is really an obstacle right now, but we ha can have some but we can have some confidence here in Vermont that that's temporary. Can you speak a bit on that? And well, you yeah. know, Phil Scott, the governor, has been making statements about how, uh, given events like the wildfires in California, that Vermont looks so much better in climate terms and that people should come here and everything's going to be rosy. And uh, we have a good quality of life here, but... Uh, we know from some of the events that we've been talking about over the last hour that uh, in the long run we're facing some pretty extreme threats and that we know we're a small state with a small population, but as on so many other issues, we can set an example for how to do things right. And uh, we can't let the obstructionists in the Scott administration stand in the way of Vermont continuing to set a good example that hopefully the rest of the country and, uh, and other countries can start to follow.
I believe he set up a panel on climate effects. He did. And I, I didn't, I haven't followed that. You know, I haven't been to any of the meetings, but my friends who have uh, have had some pretty disturbing reports. You know, people have been going and testifying and making good statements about what's needed in terms of uh, fees on carbon emissions to help ease the transition to a, a more sustainable uh, energy system, about changing transportation, more sustainable agriculture. Uh, simple things like uh, electrifying the fleet of school buses, which uh, lots of people have been hoping the settlement money from Volkswagen, you know, Volkswagen, when they cheated on their emissions, yes. had to pay a big settlement that's being distributed to all the states in the U.S. And people have been saying, let's use Vermont's share of that Volkswagen money to do some sensible things like electrify our school buses. And Phil Scott wants to instead invest in cleaner diesel buses, which means, again, being yeah, locked yeah. in. Yeah. First, there's no such thing as clean diesel. That's the lesson of yes. the Volkswagen scam. Yes. Um, and second, it locks us in, just like building the pipeline in Addison County locks us in to more dependence on fossil fuels further into the future than we can afford. Yes. Yeah, and I, I feel like, because it's part of my background, that marine engineering is going leaps and bounds. Uh -huh. We have boats that have just recently sailed around the world on solar power. Hmm. No, no sail, no fuel, solar sails. Wow. There's a new movement in recreational uh, boating, sailing, uh, to use electric motors. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And... Uh, this is something I've thought and dreamed about but never thought I would see, and it's happening. Mm -hmm. Even charter boats in the Caribbean, mm. electric engines. Yeah, which are much more efficient than any technology that involves combustion. Yes. That's a simple fact of thermodynamics. And uh, I believe it's Rolls-Royce is experimenting with a cruise ship, not a cruise ship, a a uh, uh, transport vessel hmm. for cargo, and that could also be oil even, but uh, a cargo ship run on mostly solar, uh, but still back up uh, with fossil fuel, because hmm. uh, they have to make their schedule on time. Right. But to try to incorporate Solar into these gigantic vessels is just marvelous way to think. Yeah, and some and of the makes European our, it makes our little thing with the cars and even the school bus look not childish, but uh, no smaller, we'll say. Yeah, I mean Volvo and some of the other European car companies have pledged to stop building. Uh, fossil fuel burning cars in, there in the next few years. There a number of countries in Europe and even India have banned the sale of fossil fuel driven vehicles at various points in the future. Yeah. You know, they're getting ready to phase out the internal combustion engine. Here in this country, we're going backwards. The clowns in the White House are, are promoting more coal, which the rest of the world uh, has come to realize is uh, an archaic technology. It's not just a source of climate pollution, but it's a source of extreme air pollution. It destroys the health of, first and foremost, the people who work in the industry. That's we've known for a long time. Uh, and it's, it's on its way out. Of course, China and other countries are continuing to build coal-driven power plants in various parts of the world because uh, they can export that technology, and the U.S. is 
trying to get into those same export markets because there's, it's clear that there's no future for coal domestically. Um, electricity from the sun and wind is already so much cheaper. Um, but, you know, we're, we're at a point where we're fighting all these defensive battles nationally and to some extent here in Vermont. And, uh, and it's happening at a time when we know we don't have a lot of time left. We were starting to see some forward motion. The Obama administration was not wonderful on a lot of these issues. They were, for example, continuing to promote fracking and offshore oil drilling and, and all the rest. But we were making some progress in terms of uh, efficiency standards for cars and other modest but significant measures. They were so slowly starting to maybe steer the ship in, in the right direction. But uh, the, the kinds of assaults on uh, every aspect of, of, of what's needed to move forward uh, around these issues that we're facing right now makes it, it hard for, for those of us who, who work on these issues every day. It, there are times when we can see <coughs> a fossil-free future where we're just able to all live better as a result of being relieved of these destructive and um, expensive dependencies on technologies that it's time to, to phase out. Uh, and then there are times, especially when we look at the, the climate science, when we look at the numbers, when we look at the weather trends, where it's really very difficult to see our way out at a time when we're so focused on defensive battles when we should be moving forward. Exactly. I, I've sort of felt, as you're indicating, that it should, it should be over for the times of trying to prove scientifically that climate change is happening and it's man-made. I mean, we're still working on that. Yeah. And, it, and that was clear 25 years ago it, to and, anybody who was yeah. seriously paying attention. And I wonder how we ever got to this level of ignorance and are the universities and high schools teaching things about uh, required courses in uh, climate change? I mean, I why think in the some public places is, is willingly or, or, what, or, or by lack of education grossly ignorant on so much yeah, of this. Yeah, you know, I think in some places people are getting this in school, but we also have a propaganda system in this country in the form of advertising and corporate-owned and controlled media that makes it really hard for people to, to think clearly. Uh, we have a denial industry, as uh, Naomi Oreskes wrote in her book, uh, Merchants of Doubt, that was turned into a terrific documentary that I highly recommend folks check out. Um, the same mentality, and in fact some of the same people who for years were speaking on behalf of the tobacco industry, claiming that there was too much uncertainty to legislate against uh, tobacco, against cigarettes, uh, a lot of the same people are now working for the fossil fuel industry. And in fact, some of, some of these propaganda methods originated at a much earlier time with the fossil fuel and utility industries. So th this, this goes way back. Um, these uh, kind of false... Uh, Elite populisms, the, the, the idea that uh, people are rebelling against elite control and handing more control over to the elites that are actually running things and giving them huge tax breaks. Apparently this goes back a hundred years to uh, some of the, the work of uh, the famous turn of the 20th century, Robert Barron, Andrew Mellon, who first pioneered uh, 
uh, this kind of right-wing uh, pseudo-populism that we see sweeping the country now. We have a propaganda system in this country, not just uh, mainstream media, and it's extremely well-funded. And we have, of course, interests uh, manipulating elections and controlling candidates and uh, threatening and succeeding in uh, running primary opponents against uh, Republican members of Congress who are perceived as being too moderate. Uh, and at the same time, extremes of wealth inequality in this country the likes of which we haven't seen since the onset of the Great Depression of the late 1920s. So it's really the whole system that I point to as the source of the problem. We really need a different economic system that's controlled by communities, that's controlled democratically. Uh, and this is really one of the core lessons of social ecology as well. Um, in order to overturn the power of the interests that are holding us back in the area of climate progress, that are holding us back in the area of political and economic policies, that are holding us back in terms of our ability to control the excesses of, uh, of, of the corporations that have everything to gain from continuing to destroy the stability of the Earth's climate. Let me uh, ask you about the conference that was held in Bilboa, uh, Spain, uh, in October, I believe, of this year. Um, as a way maybe to sum up with a happy ending <laughs> what we have just discussed, the problems mm -hmm. of economy, politician, uh, the populace, but in this uh, conference uh, there were people from Kurd Kurdistan, Basque country of course, uh, from areas on the globe where we have ethnic groups, you might say, that are having huge problem with nationalism, mm -hmm. however that goes into the picture. Uh, there were people from Catalan, uh, which is going huge right now. Yeah. And anyway, tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, we still have another five minutes, tell us about uh, that conference. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't there in Bilbao, but this was a, an international gathering of mostly representatives of municipally based movements around the world that are fighting for municipal control, that are fighting for direct democracy. Uh, as an alternative to the kind of elite control that we've been talking about. And in the last few years, there's been an incredible flowering of people organizing from below, of people in many cases taking power in their cities and towns and asserting their democratic rights as a counterpower to the continued management of the economy and politics by those elite interests that are destroying the planet. And that's happening here in the U.S. as well. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, there's been an incredible flowering of community assemblies, of neighborhood meetings, uh, working on taking power back from powerful institutions. Um, in Jackson, Mississippi, they just elected a mayor who comes from a black nationalist background who's committed again to neighborhood control and political and economic renewal from the ground up. Uh, this is happening in many corners of the country. There are several efforts uh, I'm aware of in New York City along these lines. 
And at the Institute, we've actually been talking about uh, doing an event sometime later this year to bring together folks doing this kind of work across the U.S. so that we can be more effectively networked with genuine movements for local, directly democratic people's power in other parts of the world. Well, good. I want to thank you so much uh, for this discussion, for your insights, uh, for your experience. Uh, and I uh, certainly hope that you'll carry on strong as a teacher <laughs> and a fighter for democracy, which seems to be an underlying given in order to correct the climate change problem. So keep up your good work. Thanks, Steve. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Yes.